kind of a challenge I would have to anybody who watches the Is Genesis History movie. When one side presents their argument, it sounds compelling mm -hmm. until somebody comes and cross-examines them. Although in our last segment, Dr. Kurt Wise admitted to Dell that the story told in Genesis is completely invisible in the evidence we find in nature. And we wouldn't have come to that conclusion if uh, you didn't have true. the word of we God. Dell is unfazed and decides to visit possibly the most famous paleontologist of all time, Dr. Ross. A paleontologist who works out, you're like Indiana Jones. <laughs> I am like Indiana Jones. No, sorry to get your hopes up once again. Dell visited Dr. Marcus Ross, a paleontologist with a PhD. Doctor? Oh, I didn't know he had a nickname. Well, his PhD is in environmental science, not paleontology. Sorry, you had a paleontologist on your face. Unlike some of the other men in the film, according to Google Scholar, Ross has never published even a single paper in a peer-reviewed journal. Oh yeah, don't get too worked up over it. I mean, it sounds like he's a doctor, but he's not. His current job is an associate professor, Apparently, the full professors were busy. Were there any questions <laughs> about paleontology? In geology, not paleontology, at Liberty University, the Christian school founded by Jerry Falwell. Word is that President Trump will be giving the commencement speech there this year. But none of that is important. What's important is Marcus's ideas and evidence. In this briefcase, I carry actual scientific facts. A Briefcase of facts, if you will. So let's see what he has for us. Del and Marcus stroll through an empty natural history museum while complaining that natural history museums give people the wrong idea about history. We're not alone. <laughs> Maybe they should have filmed this in Ken Ham's museum. Fossils tend to be found in distinct layers where there are very, very large numbers that have been destroyed. Untold billions. And so every time we see a layer of rock that's this thick, we're thinking about an event that probably took minutes to, to make, mm. not thousands of years, minutes for just this one package mm. of rock, sometimes even seconds. It's a common straw man for creationists to perpetuate a misunderstanding that mainstream geologists think that sediment accumulated slowly, grain by grain. They don't. The rocks are billions of years old, but not because that's how long it took the sediment to accumulate. It is well known that some accumulations are slow and some are fast. Again, it's important for everyone to be clear that the Rock Age claims have to do with how long these layers have been sitting there, not how quickly or slowly they formed. But for Marcus to be so bold to assert that all layers were laid down in minutes and seconds is crazy. I went looking for any papers by Marcus, or anyone really, trying to back that up with evidence, but I couldn't find anything. Of course, this is just conjecture. That was an irresponsibly bold claim to make. The flood doesn't require seconds, why overreach like that? I mean, in a segment before this, in this very film, Snelling takes great pains and screen minutes to describe mile after mile of thousands of individually formed sand dunes cross-bedding in the Grand Canyon. Now Ross will have to say that the Coconino sandstone layer would have had to have been deposited in minutes, meaning each of those diagonal dunes formed and collapsed in milliseconds somehow. So now these two PhDs completely contradict each other. Does anyone care? So you're saying that we have these uh, marine fossils all over, even on mountains? I think Dell's question was trying to set him up for the typical creationist observation that we find clam cells on the top of mountain ranges. Somewhere along the way, Marcus must have picked edges of rocks that were pushed up from the depths of the ocean as plates collided, bringing the ocean fossils with them. Good for Marcus. Yeah, you know, further back over uh, in the museum, they've got sections with things like mosasaurs, these big swimming reptiles. Mm. Mosasaurs are globally distributed, and they're distributed on continents. So looking at these things, you're saying, what is it that has the power, what is it that has the capacity to take the marine world and throw it on top mm -hmm. of the continents in such a violent and destructive manner? And, and the flood makes perfect sense for this. There's a field of science called paleogeography, where they study the ancient geography of the Earth's surface. The Earth's geography is constantly changing. Plate tectonic interactions move continents, mountain ranges are thrust upwards, and sea levels rise and fall. Believe it or not, these changes can be traced through the study of the rock and fossil record, and the massive amounts of data measured is used to create paleographic maps to demonstrate the changes. Now, the Mosasaurs Marcus speak of lived in the Cretaceous period. The Mosasaurs become more popular of late with their appearance in Jurassic World. Unfortunately, the one in the movie was depicted twice as large as the largest fossil found, and about three times the size of the average one found. Still cool on screen, nevertheless. 
Most of the chalk layers in the world were laid down during the Cretaceous period, and these chalk-based limestone layers are found all over the Earth, as Marcus suggests. The other thing to know about the Cretaceous is that it marked the Earth's highest sea levels. Here's a map of the Earth as it looked in the Cretaceous. Notice the massive waterways crossing the continents. Just for fun, let's compare that to the exact map that Is Genesis History used to demonstrate the locations of Mosasaur fossil finds. So, does a conventional paradigm need to come up with a reason why huge marine creatures were thrown on top of the continents? No, they were buried where they swam. Nothing so dramatic needed. I don't know squat about dinosaurs. It's important to point out that most young Earth geologists believe in, and in fact rely upon, continental drift to account for flood geology. They just think it happened underwater in the course of a year. So be careful which parts of this you want to dismiss. Once we start getting to those nice sedimentary rocks that have all the wonderful fossils in mm -hmm. them, uh, the pattern uh, starts to emerge. Oh good, another dinosaur story. The ecosystem that has the first animals in it shows up very suddenly. In conventional paleontology, they call this the Cambrian Explosion. Ah yes, the unfortunately named Cambrian Explosion. Now the Cambrian was a period of time about 543 million years ago. It is part of the Paleozoic Era and is predated by the Neoproterozoic Era. It's the explosion part that creationists love to latch on to, because it sounds like one of those 24-hour days from Genesis 1. However, the Cambrian period is generally defined as a 55 million year period. This explosion was 55 million years in the making. And Marcus slips a fib into his intro when he says that the Cambrian is the ecosystem with the first animals in it. Sites like Shenzhen, China have fossil records of multicellular animal life at least 30 million years before the start of the Cambrian. It's the first appearance of a wide diversity of different types of marine animals. Good for Marcus for admitting that the Cambrian was marine animals only. I've seen some attempts to deliberately mislead to the idea that all of the modern creatures we know today emerged in this little window. But there are no starfish, crabs, insects, fish, lizards, birds, or mammals of any kind in the Cambrian. In reality, it's just the handful of phyla body types in their most primitive form. For example, vertebrates are part of the chordata group, characterized by a nerve cord, gill pouches, and a notochord. In the Cambrian, we first see fossils of soft body creatures with these very limited basic characteristics. Of course, vertebrates appeared much later, and the body plans we see in the Cambrian have none of the defining features we recognize today. Some may want to say that the marine nature of the Cambrian affirms that Genesis speaks of water life before land life. But that is difficult to reconcile an exclusively marine fossil record with just a single 24-hour period in which no creature died because Eve hadn't sinned yet. Plus, birds were also said to be created on day 5 with the fish, and they don't appear in the fossil record until the very last stages. Hey everybody! Remember that thing that's been dead for a gazillion years? Well, here's a little bone we didn't know it had! All of a sudden you have this complex and whole ecosystem that shows up basically out of nowhere. Did it show up out of nowhere? Or basically out of nowhere? As mentioned, we have at least 30 million years of multi-celled animal life prior to the Cambrian, which is amazing when you think of the requirements for fossilization. Of course, it makes sense that there are a lot more fossils once bodies began to develop features like bones and shells, but we know where the Cambrian animals came from. And Marcus keeps emphasizing that the ecosystem is whole. He's attempting to play on the common misconception that evolution should somehow produce partial animals in transition, and extrapolating that false idea over to an ecosystem. What would a partial ecosystem even look like? Do you think evolution proposes that natural selection would include creatures that have nothing to eat? You see an explosion of life that is complex, whole, the ecosystem is integrated with one another, you can see where all the different organisms fit mm -hmm. with respect to one another, and that's just the first time that that happens. Wait, that's just the first time that happens? Are you trying to say there were multiple creation events? Every time you move up in the geological column, in this fossil record, you start seeing snapshots of more and more ecosystems. Wait, 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 rewind that. Every time you move up in the geological column... Did a creationist just admit that the geological column is a real thing? Now you gotta understand, the geologic column is the Bible for the evolutionists, okay? And it can only be found one place in the entire world. One place in the whole world you can find the geologic column. Guess where it's at? Right here in the textbooks. That is the only place in the entire world you can find the geologic column. It doesn't exist. Fascinating. But carry on. You've got one ecosystem that's destroyed, and then you've got another one. It's got slightly different creatures, there's different interactions going on, mm -hmm. and as the floodwaters move higher and higher, they're getting closer and closer to shore, destroying more and more organisms in the shoreline and eventually up onto land. 
These pulses of water from the flood are moving over the continents, grabbing ecosystems or dragging marine ones up from, from deeper in the ocean and pulling them onto land. And as one gets deposited and the waves come back, they start pulling and piling additional stuff on top of that. It's, and, and it's a graveyard on top of a graveyard on top of a graveyard. Okay, so let's see if we can figure out Ross's story here. The film acknowledges the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, who were apparently living in that order as isolated ecosystems from shore to inland. So the flood water grabs the Cambrian ecosystem, but if the water dragged it onto shore, then it also would have mixed with the other ecosystems. So he must have meant that the water lifted it up in the air and jumped the others and dropped it in the middle. Then the waves receded and grabbed the Ordovician, jumped that in the air and dumped it on the Cambrian. Then the Silurian, then the Devonian. Yikes, this is getting tall. Then the Carboniferous, then the Permian, then the Triassic, then the Jurassic, finally the Cretaceous. Sheesh, that doesn't even include any layers of mammals yet. I wonder where they went, because there are no mammals under these layers, not even a mouse. What about the fact that these layers are worldwide and not in isolated stacks? Is this a credible hypothesis to anyone? None of my questions have anything to do with paleontology. This is a pattern that we see in several different groups where their footprints are first and their body parts are later. Mm -hmm. For the trial bites, for the amphibians, for the dinosaurs, the first time I find evidence of them in the fossil record, it's from trackways, not the hard parts. From an old earth perspective, that's really weird and hard to grapple with because you have millions of years between the trackway production and ultimately the animal that made it. Mm -hmm. But that obviously doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Right? Because right. if there's trackways, there's animals, and those animals have bones and teeth and shells mm -hmm. to them. Why aren't they fossilized? Once again, I'm at a complete loss as to how this is supposed to be evidence of anything at all. We know that fossilization is a rare occurrence, and of those rare fossils that exist, we found only some. So Marcus points out three examples of trackway fossils that are older than the oldest corresponding body fossils. Let me give this a try. There are five million year old saber-toothed tiger fossils, but the oldest tracks from saber-toothed tigers are from just 50,000 years ago. For the woolly mammoth, the fossils are 400,000 years old, where the oldest tracks are just 40,000 years old. So here are three examples that are exact opposite of Marcus's examples. And there are tens of thousands of species where no tracks have ever been found. <gasps> what has any of this proved about the age of anything? Literally nothing. Except maybe that the earth has been a muddy place to walk all throughout its history, not just the day of the flood, however long you think that history may be. But the fact that those trackways are still there, that, that should tell us something as well, shouldn't it? One, it tells us that the deposition or the, the placement of the next layer on top of them had to happen very, very quickly. Because, again, you go out onto uh, a beach and you walk in the sand, your trackways are, are destroyed very, very mm -hmm. quickly. Fossilized remains of plant and animal bodies are necessarily the result of rapid burial where rapid is relative to happening more quickly than bodily decay or being eaten by scavengers. However, fossilized animal tracks, a subset of what are called trace fossils, are typically not formed by rapid burial, but rather gentle burying by sediments. Marcus invoked an image of footprints in wet sand, but there's nothing that can bury wet sand footprints fast enough to preserve them. Dense mud is best for preserving footprints, specifically in a period without rainfall. Indeed, we have examples of track beds featuring multiple animals where there was obviously days or weeks separating the newer and older tracks. A flood is actually the worst case scenario for any kind of track to be preserved. It's such a known problem that some creationists have gone so far as to suggest lulls during the flood to attempt to account for them. All this while, the previous segments of the film claim that the flood was so destructive that it formed the Grand Canyon in a few hours. Which is it, guys? that Marcus just straight up declares the complete opposite of demonstrable, observable, repeatable trace fossil preservation science shows just how little this movie thinks of its audience. Yeah, I mean, before, I, I didn't agree with you, but at least I respected you. <laughs> that was fun. His Genesis History Science continues with part 6, hosted by SciStrike on his channel. Tap on the video image to continue there now, or find the link in the description. But before you go, subscribe to Apologia to make sure you're notified of future episodes. Later.